Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Investor Lab, the auditory epicenter for passionate people seeking a life of freedom, choice, and abundance. And you are so lucky to be joining us today because it's not just me, the normal guy, normal guy, the normal guy talking here, but I've also got Charlie Vela, my friend, joining us for the property and business series. Charlie, how are you? Excellent and thrilled to be here for another episode in the series. I'm just stoked this is getting traction. Like this is starting to get some steam this series and I think we're going to continue on. I think we're going to continue on. I think this is be, we've actually been talking about it and this is going to become a, per, a permanent fixture, certainly permanent for the foreseeable future. And I think that um, in the context of the broader conversation that the Investor Lab stands for, I think that this brings such an, uh, an interesting and integral part, not just for business owners, but because we cover such... Uh, fundamental thinking paradigms and, and ways to approach things from a different vector. And I think in the context of the whole podcast, this gives it an extra level of flavor that is benefiting. I, I'm noticing it from the comments that I get back from people. It's benefiting people who ha- are not in business and have no intention of being in business that are coming back and going, this is such a good p- component to have as part of all of it because it's giving me some new context. So I think it's great. Oh, I love that feedback. So, what did we cover on today's episode, Goose? Mate, we covered a lot of a lot of a lot of ground. We went, I, I want to say, a little tangential. Um, we went a little esoteric, um, but ultimately, we we started talking about leverage and how to apply that: intellectual leverage, time leverage, uh, financial leverage, emotional leverage. We really dug deep on thinking strategically. Uh, versus tactically and how to apply both short sword and long sword um, thinking to your decision-making processes, not just in business, but also in real estate. Um, What else, Charlie? What else should we cover? What I thought was really fascinating from my point of view is the examples of short versus long and how to apply cause and effect to your own, I suppose, property and business portfolio in short-term thinking and long-term thinking. Mm, Yeah, I think it was was awesome. I think we, we definitely covered a lot of ground. We also really... Talked, talked into it a lot around how to find that inner place where you can actually start to think in those ways and to break down your own paradigms. Because as we kind of talked about in this episode, mindset is the biggest barrier to being able to get through to any of these kind of new plane, planes of leverage, um, strategic thinking and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of ground in this episode and I think that people are going to get a lot out of it. This is not just, this is definitely not just for business owners. Anyone who has a desire to find deeper levels of inner peace, uh, achieve greater levels of leverage, um, Think wants to think more strategically, wants tactical solutions to uh, to generate um, strategic thinking paradigms, I think that this is going to be a goldmine. I think this is potentially going to be one of our better episodes. Absolutely. And don't forget, I'll just add this in, the influence of other people on your business and property portfolio or investing portfolio, however you want to broach that. I think the influence of other people was one thing towards the end that stuck with me of just hyper importance to pay attention to. Yeah, 100%. And of course, look, as we as we mentioned at the end of the episode as well, we're really loving the feedback. So if you do enjoy this episode, then make sure you reach out and let us know. You know, you can contact us on all kinds of different platforms. And if you're failing that, just send us an email. Um, you're probably going to receive this via email. So just respond to the email. That's totally cool. We love getting feedback. And if you've got suggestions um, and things that you want us to cover, we'd love to hear from that, adhere to that as well, because we really want to serve you better. And in the meantime, if you want access to free tools and resources to help fuel your, your property journey, then just head to the investorlab.com.au. And if you want to, you know, start taking action in your property journey specifically, then we can absolutely help with that too. There's a contact form on the Investor Lab website. Just go there, let us know, book in a time, we'll have a little chat and we can actually get to understand a little bit about your situation and help you understand what the best next strategic step is. Even if that isn't buying a property right now, it could just be the advice that you need to get through to that next level. And I encourage you to reach out and book in a time with me or the team. Charlie, have I missed anything? No, that was a pretty good roundup. Fantastic. Oh, no, hang on a second. I did miss something. <laughs> oh, what'd you miss? Well, we could have got to, everyone's got to subscribe on Apple <sighs> Podcasts. Absolutely. I cannot stress this enough. That is the most important thing to help us get this message out there. Yeah. Subscribes help us the most. Subscribes help us the most. And so does sharing it with a friend, fam- a friend or a family member or a loved one. You know, sharing this with other people is really what's going to help get this message out too. So make sure you do those things, check it out. And Let's stop gas bagging. Let's get into it. What do you reckon? Let's do it. Cool. All right, guys. We'll see you on the inside.
Hey guys, welcome back to the Investor Lab. G'day, Charlie. How are you? I'm fantastic, Goose. How are you doing? I'm doing really great, actually. I'm doing I'm doing really great. We've had a bit of a change of scenery. And there's a lot going on. Life's good, man. Life's really good. So whereabouts are you at the moment? We're currently in Yamba, and this is really interesting because. You know, you know, there's a couple of really interesting, quite funny things about it. I can go a little tangential, but I've had this burning desire for like the last 10 years. For some, I have no idea where this desire came from, but then I had this desire to start a Provador in Yamba. And um, I'd never, that was before I'd even been to Yamba. So I don't even know where the thought came from, which was quite. <laughs> Do you know what? That makes it so much better. If you'd yeah. have been there, it wouldn't be as um, transcendental. Divine inspiration. I've just been like, honestly, for like the last decade, I've, I've had this burning thing. I'm like, you know what? You know what I'm going to do one day? I'm going to go start a Provador in Yamba. Anyway, so I'm finally in Yamba. And it's really interesting because um, we're still running the business. We're still working. Um, we've got a team and all of that kind of stuff. And I, I, um, have been obviously speaking with other people, clients, business owners, and all of that kind of stuff. And it really got me thinking about the concept of leverage and the concept of uh, what actually is the profit that we are seeking out of our enterprises. Um, so it's been it's been it's been a very interesting exercise for me. I think it sounds like a very important exercise. And I was just thinking about on the on the level of that, how the world's changed in the last 20 years. Like you couldn't do what you're doing now 20 years ago. And even to that point, what I do now didn't exist 20 years ago. So um, I look at it and go, what a changing world and the opportunities we have to work remotely, use virtual team. Like there's so many avenues to actually, I guess, be a bit different, not stuck in the mundane factory lifestyle. Oh, what do they call it? It was the, the revolution, the uh, industrial revolution. Yeah. Like those times have changed. We really are in this technology evolution. Well, we're in the fourth industrial revolution now, which is really fascinating. You know, the fourth industrial revolution ha- is where we, we are currently in it. And that is that is the information technology uh, revolution. And and I think the more we can lean into that, the, gr- the better we are the better we are able to perform in our lives. And I think this is a really interesting topic. And you know, catch me if I get a little tangential here, but because I think it's really important. When we think about leverage, um, there's a bunch of different ways we can think about it. You know, we've got financial leverage in real estate. We can kind of talk about that. We can talk to that. Then there's leverage in terms of time. You know, there's leverage in terms of, okay, how can I buy back some of my time? There's leverage that you can get by having good systems in your business. There's leverage you can get by having the right team so you can outsource tasks and all of that kind of stuff. And I was having a really fascinating conversation with a friend of mine who's a business owner. And we were talking, we, we have a sort of a regular catch up and we talk about business and we talk about all this kind of stuff. And uh, and I was, I was chatting to him about profit. And I said, what how different would your business be if you prioritized leverage over net profit? And and it was a really fascinating way to think because if you prioritize leverage, i.e. prioritize time as the metric of profit as opposed to cash balance as the metric of, of profit, how much more profitable on a cash balance would you be able to be? Because, for example, if you could buy back you know, 50 hours a week or 40 hours a week or 30 hours a week, what would you be able to do with that time? And how would that translate into real profits? So for example, you could be more strategic in the, in the real estate game. Maybe you could start thinking about joint ventures and more complex structures. Um, if you had a business, which you actually had a lot of leverage from and only had to work in it four or five, six hours a week, maybe you could start another business that would actually produce more income. And, and how much more profitable actually on a cash basis would you be if you focused on being profitable on a time basis? Now, I thought it was a really interesting discussion to have. Oh, I've got to tell a story here. I Go have for to. It. And this isn't pre-rehearsed either. I wish it was. We we could have actually pre-rehearsed for this episode <laughs> so much better. I'll just force <laughs> that right now. Um, so my first business, my my first true love, you know, it's like my first, you know, your first girlfriend or your yep. first partner, you know, whatever you look at it from there, you've got a special place for them. You always will. Um, when I look at this, uh, my first business is I had a marketing agency and I made the fatal mistake. And I mean fatal of being the only one that could actually do the work. <laughs> I got Ooh. so damn good at a particular uh, style of Google AdWords and Facebook ads. The problem was when people hired us that the best I could do was kind of leverage myself or I'll say an extension, right? So I had people working for me, but really everything had to pass through me to be successful or run really, really well. Eventually got to 15 staff, so incredibly tired. Like this yep. is 100 hour weeks. This is the, the craziness and the manic because like I didn't truly understand the concept of leverage. I thought just hiring people is leverage when really if you hire someone and you still have to do the work to make it work, 
That's liabilities, not leverage. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. You're just adding more moving parts to the machine. And, and do you know what? My exact experience was horrible. Absolutely horrible. I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, on the back of that, though, I was like, okay, I got. I got to work out how to do this stuff differently. I really got to work out how to do this stuff differently. My second business, I started a, an outsourcing company. So we were uh, hiring VAs in the Philippines and then uh, bringing them in to work with Australian businesses. So I did that with someone called Lynn Padetti, who is awesome. If you ever hear this, Lynn, you're awesome. She is um, awesome. I'll, I'll attest to that. She's great. Yeah. And the really big key difference between my first business and the second one was I couldn't do the work. Right. So in the first business, I could jump in and like fix someone's account and get the result and influence the result. In the second business, right, there was no way at all for me to go and be a VA. Mm. And it forced me into this position of leverage because every time um, we did it, it's like I couldn't actually contribute in that behavior and it changed the way I thought about things. Mm. So as we sold more um, things, so we're like, we we're growing the business, I was marketing it, like I brought my skill set from the first business into the second, I'm marketing it, we're growing it, and we're marketing it, we're growing it. I step back and I'm like, hang on, as my bank account grows and the profitability of this company grows, my time isn't increasing. Like there's no actual connection between my time and how much money we make. Um, and that's because we sold a recurring service. So people would hire staff. That was a recurring payment. But then the other side of that was that once we made a sale is that really my contributions changed. And when I understood that at a different level, I started going around Australia and speaking at a whole bunch of different events, doing partnerships, as you mentioned before. And then at a point, it exploded past the money I was making in the first business when I was doing everything. But I, I would say this was accidental. <laughs> I won't say it was intentional. It was that the nature of the business changed. But once mm. I had that experience, it's like you never go back. You go, oh, hang on, this is freaking awesome. Like I want to be involved in that way. And then on the back of that, starting Vela Media, which I mean, we're heavily involved in podcasts, but I will admit, I still don't know how to edit a podcast. Like I'm, and I have no intention of learning it because leverage is the game. If I start doing that, the company can't be at the success level. I want. Yeah, totally. And I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really interesting because when you start thinking about leverage in all of its uh, mechanical facets, it starts to change the game and the way that you think about life. So for example, um, you know, leveraging time back, let's say you've got a business and it, and it, and it creates enough pro If you work in it, it creates enough money to pay your wage, right? It's a pretty common scenario that business owners may have a team, but the business really, it makes enough money to pay them a wage when they work in it. So they have a job in the business, even if they have say five or six uh, team members, that's a pretty common position for a lot of business owners to be in. So then, then the question is, well, what would happen if you leveraged your way out of that business? And a lot of business owners that are in that position would say, but then I wouldn't have any money. I would lose my income. I would lose my job, right? And so they're scared of actually losing the job inside their business, which is really interesting. But the reality is if you could leverage your way out of that, let's say, let's just call it 40 hours a week that you're working in the business, probably more if you're a business owner. Um, if you could leverage your way out of that 40 hours in the business and get yourself all of that time back, what else would happen with that time? Because I think most people inherently are creative and all of this kind of stuff. And they would think, okay, well, what else can I do? Now, you may find that um, you have a choice. You have a choice to either do not much and go, well, you know what? I actually basically don't have to work, albeit maybe I only earn a fraction of my former income, but hey, maybe I can just sit on a beach and read books and maybe that is fine. And maybe that's actually the financial freedom point that a lot of people seek, that they're like, hey, you know what? Actually, I only earn you know, a few hundred bucks a week, but I can sit on a beach and I can read books and I don't have to go to work anymore and the business runs. Hey, how good? How good is that? Alternatively though, you may earn a few hundred bucks a week, but then go, hmm, what if I thought about how I could go and form some strategic partnerships or some JVs or how could I think about this differently? Because you suddenly have the creative freedom to think as opposed to the obligation to do. And I think that this leverage is, is it, this concept actually then changes the idea of profits, as I kind of said at the start, to actually the real profit being generated out of time. Because if you think about the, the geometrical kind of an exp exponential and geometric growth patterns, they're all going to come out of that, that ability to have the time to think. And so therefore, time actually becomes the real profit metric. What do you think? That is the experience you just described is exactly how I felt. Like um, it, my mind went exponential and creative. 
Mm. It's really fascinating that, um, again, unintentionally, it just went there. Like that's just what happened. Um, and I think you can relate. But one of the things I find really interesting in this, and I'm, I'm very curious on your thoughts from here, I've seen inside a lot of businesses. I've mm-hmm. worked with a lot of businesses. I suspect most of them wouldn't actually be profitable if they made the moves I made. Like I think a lot of businesses aren't actually set up to yeah. do that or make that transition. And I think that can be a very hard pill for some people to swallow. I really think it is, is that there's probably a bigger game to thinking about it. If they did hire to replace themselves, it would actually go negative. Maybe after some time working in, a, a as we mentioned, this exponential role or doing these partnerships, it would come back. But the ideation of being unprofitable or making those moves, like they're, they're just not set up to handle it either uh, cash wise mm. or mindset wise. Well, I, I think it's I think it's more mindset than anything else because if you were in that position, let's just say let's just say um, the you, you built a business and the single remaining core function that you had to do was kind of because you were the business owner, you were the main salesperson in the business. You were going out, you were you were marketing, you were generating opportunity, and then you were converting that opportunity into clients, and then you had a team that served them. Right? Let's just say that was the position that you're in. And let's say you went, okay, well, what if I hire a salesperson? Oh, but what if there's what if that depletes our, pro, our, our our margins? What if that goes negative? Well, then maybe the only single function that you have to do is make sure there's enough opportunity volume, and it really changes the way that you think about things. Because if if when you look at that and do that analysis, it goes you know a thousand dollars a month negative, let's just say in in cash flow, then then you act. But but if by doing that you gain forty hours back, it's like. A per week, so we'll call that you know 160 hours a month. Then the question is not, am I about to go a thousand dollars a month negative cash flow? It's like, could I make an extra thousand dollars a month if I had an extra 160 hours of time? And that I think is a really interesting way of thinking about it because it's very challenging though. This is where it tests your confidence, doesn't it? It, it really abso- does. It absolutely te- <laughs> it absolutely tests your confidence. And I think it I think it actually tests more than confidence. I think it tests self worth because a lot of people. Um, attach their ego to their activities. And I think that um, when- I, I, I'll pull my hand up and say, I've struggled with this. I yeah. really have. Yeah. How have you overcome it? I've had some interesting experiences. I feel like the universe is the best teacher. Mm. So um, I'll, give, I'll give you the example is like um, when I was working a hundred hours a week in the first marketing agency, like we were profitable. I was making great money. I mean, I'm half dead, obese, very bad health conditions, but um, there was one Christmas that came around and one of the clients had a Boxing Day sale. So I left Christmas lunch with uh, my partner's family to go and set up all the ads to turn on everything for Boxing Day. And it was very noticed and it was like there was this moment when I was like, that's not okay. And I was like, oh, shit. Mm. Um, and it was like when I when I, my awareness to the other things in my life and how bad they were going because of my behavior – I had justifications till that point and then I was like, okay, there was these moments where like the mindset mindset shift completely moved for me and I was like, well, you don't have any more options now. You have to change. Like there's uh, big damage being done and it's not sustainable. So I, I tend to have these moments where things get so bad that the pain of not changing <laughs> becomes more dominant. So that, that's been prevalent for me. And then once you change... I don't think you ever go back. Like I would never sign up to work 100 hours a week in a business anymore, ever. Like why would you? There's better ways. Yeah. Well, and for, when when you actually state it like that, who would want to do that? Who who actually would say, you know, you know what? I I want to go and start a business because I really don't want to spend any time uh, on my own. I don't want to spend any time with my friends or family. I don't want to enjoy life. I don't want to do anything like that. Nobody would actually sign up to do that. They'd say, oh, maybe I'll just go get a job. You know, like that would be the real consideration. Hey, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I'm not against no, jobs. Not against absolute, small people's. It's about choice, right? If you like, and that's the thing, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a job because, hey, there's security and you get holidays and all of this kind of stuff. And you, guess what? you get to switch off when you go home. Like, I think it's totally awesome. I mean, there's a plenty of times where I've thought, should maybe I should just go and get a job. I'm not quite sure I'm cut out for, um, for that. Um, but, but it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a, a choice. And when you're faced with those options where you go, okay, what, what am I actually signing up to do? Am I actually signing up for stable, reliable income, a lot of hours, uh, uh, not a lot of money, whatever the case may be, you got to make sure you're making those choices consciously. And oh, just to bring this in though, right? Yeah. I actually think the bigger problem, right? Well, what for me, this is what I experienced. And I think this is probably the bigger challenge here. Mm. Um, my first year in business, I lost money. 
Okay. It wasn't a good experience. I was, you know, very excited and naive going in and was beaten with the reality stick uh, rather harshly in my first year. Greatest learning experience ever, but financially very um, challenging. Mm -hmm. And um, really, you know, I want to be the provider of my family. Like that was the intention of business is to provide for me. And I want to look after the family. And um, to have had such the opposite effect in year one hurt. And year two, in all honesty, wasn't much better. (laughs) But after you go through that experience and then you're like, right, I've I've really got to make some changes, you get something working. I mean, you're working your 100 hours, you're putting it in and you get it working and then it becomes habit because you remember that pain of uh, harsher financial decisions. And I mean, Mm. not to speak to how harsh, but it's like I remember sitting here and like, I wonder what we could rent out the spare bedroom for because I was like, oh, we might struggle to make the mortgage here. Like we, it could happen. So you go from that to a place of working 100-hour weeks and then your money problem goes away. But then the the habit of years of working 100 hours a week or mine, I'm exaggerating, of course. I didn't work 100 hours every week, but as a number yeah, for yeah. context, yeah. Um, it becomes habit. And then we enter this phase where it's like we're not thinking about getting our time back. We're just stuck in the habit of doing it. And I look in the other areas of my life and like I'm a cyclist and it's like it's more painful for me not to go for a ride than it is to go for one. Like athletes become very habitual. So the habit of being busy, the habit of uh, overworking and filling our time with these activities, I think, hold a lot of people back from experiencing business leverage as well. Like they just never get there or make it a priority. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And you know, and this, this, and this, we kind of touched on this in the in the last episode. I think it was when we talked about optimizing for wealth. You know, it's this idea of getting stuck in survival mode and then trying to move past that, which is which is why I think, and we can talk. We'll probably come, we'll probably I reckon we'll circle back around to like leverage from the from the real estate context as well, because I think that's that leverage is the most interesting thing about real estate and actually that's where all the money's made is is in the is in the leverage and the debt which is fascinating but this idea of getting stuck in survival mode and ending up five or six years down the line still going oh my god if i don't work 100 hour weeks i'm never going to make i'm not going to make any money and it's all going to fall apart is actually creates this dichotomy where you're constantly playing the short game you know you're constantly it doesn't matter how much money you're making. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're only ever playing a short game. You're playing a game of scarcity because you're constantly thinking, if I don't, this will fail and everything is balanced on a knife edge, right? And that's and that I think is, is a really challenging uh, place to be stuck in psychologically because that affects your decision-making processes, even with like when building a real estate portfolio because you're going to be thinking about what do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? And not... Not okay. What do I need to do now and later? And how do we play both the the short sword and the long sword in these kind of uh, discussions? I think that's uh, when you start to break through those thinking paradigms. It's a mindset. It's a hundred percent mindset. I would say it's mindset more than anything because the reality is, if you were put in a p- position where you only had three hundred dollars a week to live on, you'd live on it. You know, you'd be okay. And so, but the reality is, we get so scared that we're going to fail that we operate out of a place of scarcity, not a place of abundance. And that affects our decision-making, which ultimately sabotages our future. Hugely so. I couldn't agree with anything more. I'm looking at this right now. and I mean, personal nerve topic as well, of course, but I look at these and go, all right, Goose, we're working in on the idea that I think most people that listen to this podcast probably understand leverage to a degree. They're like, I get it, right? If I've got property or I'm using debt yep. or I've got I've hired people in my business or I'm using software or systems, like I've got some leverage and I see that. How do you start to alter the mindset side of it though? How do you help someone zoom in and zoom out and see both pictures? I mean, I'll ask how you go about it personally and then I might share my version and then is there any practices or rituals you think are important to creating that own experience for yourself? Because I know a lot of people just don't do it. You know, it's an interesting one because I haven't consciously built a practice around it. But now that you ask the question, it's made me think, okay, actually, why is it that I... Maybe that- you naturally do it because you I- are a big thinker. I've received some Loom videos from you and it's like... Sh- stratosphericly big <laughs> yes yeah I, I i think i naturally do it but if i wanted to and, and i just thought then like how would i distill that down into the way that i think and there's an interesting thing that um uh tim ferris has talked about i think he might have talked about it in the four hour work week and again this is not my practice but i think it's it actually it's like it's something i do subconsciously it's called fear setting right and so when you actually um and it might sound bizarre because who who wants to focus on their fears but i always actually enjoy the process of saying 
what is the worst that could happen? And, and can I can I live with that downside? And I think it's actually extremely liberating because if you can sit there and say, well, I mean, hey, you know, if it all went, what if it all, if it all fell apart, would I be okay? And when you get to that place where you can find comfort and satisfaction in that, and honestly, I think a lot of that comes from once you've actually, if you've ever experienced lows, the, the depth of the low that you've experienced is the depth of your understanding of lows. And so you can always revert back to that and go, well, if it got back to that, I survived it. So would I be able to survive that again? I think positioning positioning your current or potential future state against uh, the darkest place you know and knowing that you've survived through it, I think is an interesting way to reframe your perspective. Because um, at the end of the day, you've got everyone's got to make a choice, you know, and we and we have the opportunity to make a choice of whether we're going to live live in fear or live in in spite of fear. And I think that the best way to do that is to is to be be prepared to uh, experience discomfort in the pursuit of a greater greater goal. I'm not sure if that answered it. But. I do think you said something interesting, though. I think people that have gone through or done difficult things are at an advantage in this realm. Yeah. Because, like, I, I mean, not that I want to or preface this, but if I had to start again, sweet, let's do it. Like, it's not an issue for me because I have that belief and conf- confidence in myself I could. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've built an awesome business and I love it and I don't want to do that in any way. But at the same time, uh, knowing that that's an option for me changes the perspective. Like, yeah. it really does. So I think that's a fascinating idea. But then th- the second component to that, which I think is, is probably more interesting, one of the things I've seen in you quite regularly, you tend to spend time away from your business or in Yamba in this experience and actually create room for this. Mm. So I don't know if that's intentional, but my own experience has been that my biggest thinking and long game thinking has always come from holidays, long weekends, doing things differently, being around other people that are thinking in a bigger way. Like it's never happened at my desk ever. No, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I think you can only, I think there's, I think there's a few practices that, that, that need to be put into play. You need to give yourself time and space to think, you know, there's, uh, you need to be exposing yourself to challenging thoughts. It's not, it's not enough to um, just spend your time uh, reading business books and, and real estate books and thinking about all that kind of stuff. You need to spend time in a place where you are confronted by your own thoughts or seek out confrontation to your own thoughts. I mean, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be quite honest. I mean, in the last few weeks leading up to, you know, as I say, we're, we're currently in Yamba, not in Bondi, which is where we normally are. How did we end up here? We basically spontaneously jumped in a car and started driving and just thought, well, let's just see where we end up. We, we're still working. We're still running in the business we still got the team we're still doing we're still doing technically we're still doing the hours you know we're still probably doing eight hours a day uh in the business six days a week like it's it's all kind of functioning but the interesting thing is i was starting to get stressed out in the business and i thought hang on a second i've gone I've, i'm feeling too because I, I, I like to think on a metaphysical level and quite a spiritual level and i was feeling i'd gone quite yang you know i was focused on business mechanics and like oh, you know all of these kind of very structural and masculine ideas and i thought wow i actually need to i actually need to get more balance back and i need to get i need to yin out right so get the yin back to my yang and i and i was like oh man this is quite confronting like how do i i'm not naturally you know, uh, well, I, I guess I am probably more naturally spiritually inclined than, than than a lot of people. But I actually had to go and seek it out. I started going, okay, well, I'm going to go listen to some Law of Attraction books and stuff like that to to deliberately pour a different kind of fuel into my tank so that I could gain the perspective that I need because it's all in balance. You know, like just saying, all right, think it and it will happen, and all of this kind of stuff. The full Law of Attraction going fully one way, I think, is 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 incorrect. Like I don't, I don't think you can. I don't think you can sit on the floor and wish your way to a million dollars. However, conversely, thinking the only way to get to a million dollars is to hustle and grind and oh, I'm going to force my way there. That's that's energetically out of balance as well. So I think that you you need to consciously seek out a way to challenge your own thought. Now, don't get me wrong. I ended up listening to like the law of attraction books that were talking to me about archangels and stuff. And I was like, hang on a second. This is like, okay, maybe you're going a little far for me, but it was interesting nonetheless, because it brought me back into balance and put me back in a better state. That's so interesting. And I'll tell you why I find that fascinating. Um, so as, as I've mentioned pr- uh, profusely through every podcast I ever do, I'm a cyclist, if you didn't pick that up. Um, so one of the places I like to go is bright. Okay. It's uh, the Mecca if you're in Victoria. And I think about, well, what I find so interesting is you you have something that causes the effect. So for mm. you, it was listening to those uh, spiritual books or listening to something that creates the environment for that type of thinking. There's two for me. There's two. So one is Rich Dad, Poor Dad, 
I have listened to that audiobook so many times and read that book so many times mm. because it it challenges my thinking around a balance sheet instead of profitability. It really does make me think in leverage. Um, it may not be for everyone, but for myself included, it really pulls me out of line of, okay, just grow revenue, make more, just grow revenue, just grow revenue, make more sales. Like it, it pulls me out of that thinking of more short game. Mm. It makes me think about cash flow and leverage, which is is quite fascinating. And then the second one is a book by Keith Cunningham called The Road Less Stupid. Yeah. And yeah. Um, every time I listen to those, I would say I would have to be up there in the person that's listened to those two the most. Maybe not, but I'd be high on the list. Um, and I just find that when I hear those books or read those books, it changes the way I go about thinking about the short game and the long game. It changes yeah. the way I think about leverage. And I think these topics are almost intertwined to a degree. But I want to bring this back to an idea here because I think it's really interesting when we cover topics that apply to both business and property. Yeah, And we'll go through these one by one. But from your perspective, when we're thinking about leverage, and we'll start on leverage, mm. what are the principles that come from, let's say, business into property or property into business? And I'll give you one is like the use of debt like other people's money yep. is a leverage that applies to both. But let's go through and give an example of each. What are some other ones? Well, I think there's 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 leveraging team and time, right? You know, the, at the end of the day, I, I stand by my point that I think that uh, that time is the true metric of profit, not cash, right? So if you can buy back time. So, I mean, I use a, I use a real example. We've had clients, I had multiple clients that have come to us after – you know, trying to do their own research and find their own properties and all of that kind of stuff. And and I'm literally, I'm not exaggerating. Some of them have spent 20 or 30 hours a week, every week for six to nine months. Okay. And then, and, and still haven't actually gotten the result. You know, they haven't actually bought a property and then you go, okay, well, hang on a second. What is the real cost of that? Not only the opportunity cost, but you know, the, the actual time cost, you know, one of them, I said, all right, what's your hourly rate? And uh, I think he earned about $50 an hour. Uh, I calculated his hourly rate and it's like it was literally tens of thousands of dollars that he'd essentially just burnt, right? And and in the process, had not spent any time with his wife. You know, so you've got you've got team leverage, which I think is really translatable in business because a lot of people think, all right, I'm, I don't want to be stuck on the tools the whole time. So I'm going to build a team to help me do all this kind of stuff. But people also don't think about that with, with property. Now, it's not just about like, hey, you can get a buyer's agent because they can go find a property for you. It's also thinking about other things as well. You know, like it's thinking about building a finance team. It's thinking about, okay, all right, do I want to do a small development? Am I going to try and work out how to do the application? You could, you know, anyone can do anything. I firmly believe that any human barring a physical or intellectual disability can pretty much do anything. And so, yeah, you could probably go and manage your own small development, but is that actually the best way to do it? Is the, is it the lowest risk and, and you know, bit most profitable way of doing it? Probably not. And in fact, if you then looked at time as being the metric of profit, you're probably going to end up in a, a negative profit position because of the amount of time, energy and stress that it's going to take, right? So you've got that kind of leverage. Oh, you can always break it. Someone broke this down for me and it changed an opinion there. Like you mentioned team here, but there's mm. kind of two versions within that. So I'll give you an example. Like you could buy labor, like you can pay someone to move a pile of bricks from one yep. spot to another. That's labor. But then you can also actually like buy um, brains. You can buy someone's experience. Yeah to shortcut as well. And it's in this category here, you've kind of laid that out as you might have someone, I don't know, doing a survey where they're going out there and like get their stick out and put some measurements down. We'll call that labor. Um, but then the other side of that is like the strategy is people's brains. You can buy that. You don't have to spend the time doing that amount of research. So that yeah. definitely applies here. And I think is underserved in importance in real estate. I don't think people, um, if you were going to hire a big team for business, you'd almost say like, oh, so what? Everyone does that. Yeah. But the idea of doing that in your real estate is like almost like, what do you mean? Nah, it's it's so unique. So which, which, yeah, which which is which is crazy, right? Because if you think about if you think of that that as a as a pure metric, right? If you're going to go buy a five hundred thousand dollar house, that's a five hundred thousand dollar investment. Yet a lot of the time, people will go, well, ah, you know, it's just property. I'll just go and kind of work it out. If you were going to make a five hundred thousand dollar investment in your business, you would probably you'd probably uh, join a mastermind, do a course, get some mentors, ask each of You do all of this kind of stuff and you'd, you'd invest a lot of time, energy, money, and then you'd probably pay some professionals to help, right? So, um, you know, whether they be an ad specialist or whatever the case may be. And it's the same thing, to, to, touching on that point that you you pay for minds, like edu information leverage is super important, you know? And I think that um, understanding what, how that's how the, the value of strategy rather than just the value of doing, I think is, 
is incredibly important. And you can do that in business as well. You know, like, you know, we train our team, we, you know, actively, we're like, okay, cool. We, I want people to be constantly learning. I don't want people to just be doing rote activities. I want people to constantly be learning and upskilling and, and understanding strategy and I'll coach them. And I'll also seek out other stuff to educate me better and to educate them better so that we can get more intellectual leverage in the business as well. Hugely so. And this applies to agents as well. There's there's so many ways to look at it with team that I think is really interesting. Is there any other forms of leverage you think universally come across? And I mean, the one that comes to mind for me is technology. I think Mm. technology is probably the most interesting one in both areas, to be honest. How? How so? All right. I'll I'll look at this right now is um, you're in Yamba running a business virtually through software and tools that weren't available five years ago. Yeah. The internet and infrastructure that's there just didn't exist. Like... I don't know, it, like I, I laugh now that it's like um, just the internet speeds we grew up with that we thought were quick. Oh, yeah. I remember how groundbreaking it was when I, we got cable internet. I was like, holy crap, we can watch YouTube. Like this is like, you know, game change and we take it for granted. Yeah. So I look at this in business and just say like the disruption rate of business is just outstanding at the moment. And I think even this year, how many companies are going virtual and how many things are changing or about to change because of it fascinates me and I think businesses that capitalize on that the best and pay attention to it the best will be the most successful yep. undoubtedly but in property it's almost um, kind of becoming the same and I'll give you an example I mean I won't speak to the names of it but you've shared some tools with me there was a company you were looking at and the way they're collecting data and looking at things to decide what areas to buy in or to look at the opportunity or not opportunity of an area I like go, who was doing that 20 years ago? Could you even do that 20 years ago? Yeah. And I, I just think that um, that's fascinating. Yep. But then behind the scenes of that at a, a different level is also like even the tools you use to build a portfolio or this, um, I know you've got calculators and things that assist with that. I go, that stuff's starting to become a lot more relevant or even the search power of realestate.com.au. Mm. Like these platforms are playing a bigger role in real estate. It's not the same. And I think to the degree, the same level on this side, it's going to become so much more interesting. Totally. And I think that really changes. It's a really interesting thing you've brought up there because I think that actually changes the game in the way people can invest. You know, I, I saw a, um, uh, a, a buyer's agent, or a pro, like a property specialist, someone I actually really respect. You know, they're, they're very well known and I think they're really great at what they do and, and all of that kind of stuff. But they're a little more old school. And um they have a propensity to um, market their business by attacking other people. Now, and I say that kindly, like they always take a, a principal position and I'm not, I'm not trying to inflame anything, but they've previously built uh, a business around, that built their real estate uh, advice or real estate um, buyer's agency based around attacking financial planners first. And now they're attacking other buyer's agents saying, you know, you need to only work with someone who can, physically go to the house and physically inspect it and then go and meet with you. Like very old school kind of thinking. And I'm like, well, that's, that's really, that is really interesting because, you know, if we change the game a little bit and if we, if we look at how we can leverage technology to give us, you know, core data and information around um, key metrics so that we know what to look for and where the best place to buy is, then if we build a team that is designed to be able to be those people on the ground, they're actually going to be better place to do it. Right? Think about this. Let's just say we decided to buy in, uh, I'm, I'm just going to say Perth, right? I don't really know Perth very well. Okay, I've been there. It's nice. Sunset over the water. Hey, how cool, right? If I was to go and buy a property for a client in Perth and I was like, okay, I've got to go to the property. I, I've got to go and suss out if it's good. And I fly over there and I get there and I check it out. I would literally have no idea um, what the reputation of the street is. I would not really understand the social dynamics of the area. I wouldn't know whether what I was looking at was be- really below par or above par necessarily without leveraging the experience and knowledge of people locally, right? And so when you can do that, you know, you develop relationships with property managers. You're like, hey, we're looking at these kind of properties in these areas. Is this all good? And sometimes, honestly, you'll get get the property managers come back and go on, you buy a property in that street where we're having nothing to do with it. And you're like, ah, okay, interesting. And this is where you can actually start to get a lot more leverage, which is actually how I am actually managed to be, you know, in Yamba right now. We're still functionally operating a business. We've got plenty of clients. We're buying amazing properties and, you know, people are making loads of money and everyone's very happy. But that doesn't mean that I need to be straddled to my desk in Bondi, nor does it mean that I need to be, you know, stressing out about making sure I'm going and, you know, 
putting my hand on the door handle of every property we ever buy. I think it's I think it's uh, uh, a tactically inept way to think about operating a business in the current current environment. I think it's only going to change faster too. Yeah, it's uh, generationally things are just so different. I look at um, like the dip, my mum who is well, she's a boomer. We'll just be honest. Them <laughs> ruin the world. No, I joke. I joke. But um, she she's a boomer and like um, she's technology like she's just starting to hit that cusp of like using her mobile to make payments yeah and like starting to adapt where it's like for me it's second nature like and then i look at the as we go further down the line like a 20 year old will never know what it's like to a 20 year old today will never go to the post office to pay bills yeah it's not going to happen so it's like this cycle is only going to move faster and faster and what we consider normal technology wise is only going to start being adopted at a faster rate totally and the, the more that we can embrace leverage the more money we can make like let's let's be real like you know we're, and and there's no shame in that you know the the more uh the more money we can make the more time we can buy back and the more freedom we have and that's ultimately what we're talking about is leverage right we're, we're talking about all of that now here's the here's the the brutal reality right if you're if you live in Victoria and Brisbane is the best place to buy, and I'm not suggesting that that is the best place to buy right now, and your only option is, well, I, I don't really know Brisbane. I don't. I can't get to Brisbane. It's you know three two thousand kilometers away, whatever the case may be. All of that kind of stuff. Well, I guess I'll just buy locally. The reality is, you could miss out on literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, or in context over time, the, a, a real opportunity cost of millions purely by not using any leverage and going, well, I can I can only operate in this vector. But as soon as you can start to branch out your mind and start to think a little bit differently, a little more strategically, I think this is what we're getting down to at the moment is, is really like strategic thinking as opposed to tactical thinking. Because if you do think strategically around you know, how to structure your life. And you touched on a really interesting thing uh, when you said about uh, listening to Rich Dad Poor Dad and thinking about balance sheets. I always think, like to think about not just a business balance sheet, balance sheet, but a life balance sheet, right? And a life balance sheet must have a variety of resources on it. It can't just be financial. You know, it's got to be, you know, financial and time and all of these other kind of things. And that's how you look, how you think about your life balance sheet. So if you're, if you're purely operating within the vector of your own tactical capabilities and not thinking strategically, you're not going to be building up those assets and resources on your balance sheet that are going to get you to where you want to go. And ultimately in the business of life, you're going to be left wanting. See, that's when you look at it like that. It's mm. I think about this often. I, I tend to look at my personality type. I think I'm an addictive type. I yeah. really get into things. Like when I get into something, it's not like I noticed it very differently when I started hanging around other humans. <laughs> it's like I'd pick up a new hobby and like I would just over obsess with it, and I couldn't. And it's like it's within me. Uh, I've got to be very careful of what I, I get into because I'll go all in. Um, but when I um, look at this in today's type of thing, that's why I like having that set time away or listening to different material mm. is it can pull me out of that. But it's interesting that you bring it to time. What what I want to do now though is I, I we're kind of leaning on the idea of like short game and long game here and how to yeah. separate those two. In a real estate sense, right? And we could even bring this back to business as well, but I want to start with real estate. How would you define the difference between short-term thinking and short-term decision-making versus long-term here? And where do you kind of draw that line? That's a, it's, a, it's a good question. And whenever I talk about long and short game, I always like to start with a story. So the story is about a Japanese swordsman called Miyamoto Masashi. So he is uh, revered as Japan's greatest swordsman ever. Ever, you know, he was in 64 battles to the death and never lost a single one. Uh, he wrote a book called The Book of Five Rings, which is one of the greatest, uh, you know, most ethereal kind of philosophical books on uh, the strategy of fighting and also business. It's one of the least read ones in business, so it's really interesting. Um, and, and it's it's he's this amazing and a real human being, right? A real guy who who lived a couple of centuries ago. Now. The thing about Miyamoto Masashi is that he always fought with two swords. So anytime you see a picture of Miyamoto Masashi, you know, in, in any of the carvings or whatever, he has two swords on his belt. And this was a very distinctive characteristic of Miyamoto Masashi. One sword was always one sword was always short 
and one was long. So no matter where he was in, in the environment, whether he was inside or outside, he would have the right tool to fight the right battle at the right time. And that was one of the secrets to his success. He never, he never just had a long sword. So if he was attacked inside or something like that, he would have his short sword to be able, be able to play a shorter, more near field game. And if he was outside, he could pull out the long sword. And, and this was one of the keys to his success. And I think this is a, such a beautiful analogy on how to think about short and long term, you know, thinking, tactical and strat- strategic thinking. You know, when you're thinking short term, you're going to be thinking near field. You're going to have the short sword, and you're going to be going, okay, what do I need now? What is the thing that is closest to me that needs to be attacked? What's what's the closest thing right in front of me that I need to sort out right now? Now, in a lot of cases, when you think about real estate or even business, that's typically going to be what is the resource I need most, you know? So it could be in business, it could be like, we need cash. We need cash flow. Like short sword could be like, I, I got to go make sales now, right? I need to go and make some sales because the business needs cash. Uh, in real estate, it could be, well, I I currently um, don't have enough capital. Or if I buy one more property, I'm going to run out of capital. So how do I need to think about that purchase so that it's going to be able to fund the next one? Like, what is the near field thing? Now, when you're thinking about that in real estate, that could translate, or it could be could be a cash flow play. You might need more cash flow in your portfolio in order to be able to continue to borrow. And so when you start thinking about that, then you start thinking about maybe more short term projects. So it could be do I do a renovate for profit and or do a flip. Do I do a development flip, you know, where I might buy, develop and sell so I can release the capital, put it back into my portfolio and then have the have the bandwidth and the breathing room to start thinking longer term. And this is kind of the difference in 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 the thinking is like, is it a short term strategy or a long term strategy? And what does my portfolio need most right now in order to get me to the next step? Because what where a lot of people come unstuck is they only think with a long sword or they only think with a short sword. And only using one tool is going to put you in, in just as bad a situation. So if you only think with the short sword and you're like, okay, uh, okay, the shortest pathway to profit is um, I'm going to do flips. I'm only going to do flips. I'm going to do a flip and then another flip and another flip and another flip and another flip. That's not sustainable and you're not going to be able to do that for the next 30 or 40 years or, and be happy. Plus, it's typically going to be slightly higher risk, right? Because you're you're operating you know, on, on a battlefield that is on a much nearer field, right? You don't have as much room to maneuver, quite literally. But conversely, only playing with a long sword can mean that sometimes things that are closest to you can actually kill you. So, for example, in business, if you're only thinking long-term strategy, and not focusing on near field cash flow, your business can go broke. Whilst I have a you're- great story on this. <laughs> I have a great story on right. this. Also, I, I want to hear because it's really interesting, right? So an example of that might be like, all right, I'm going to invest in this aspect of my business, which is going to make me a million dollars over the next five years. However, it's going to deplete my cash flow now and I'm not going to survive another three months. And this is this is the difference between short and long-term thinking. Now, long-term in real estate is probably something that's a little bit more buy and hold. But I, I, I'm curious to hear this. I'm curious to hear this story. Well, I, I mean, I can easily understand how this could happen in real estate, right? Mm. You buy a massively negatively geared property yeah. and then you go, nah, 10 years from now, this thing's going to be killing it. Yeah. But it, then in the short term, you lose your job, you can't put your money into it or whatever happens, life yeah. happens. And then you lose the property because you weren't able to, on the short term, put that cash in. In business, though, there's some, some interesting ideas is that I, I came across uh, one person who I will not name who decided that the only way they were going to be successful in business is they needed a massive audience. So only when they had a hugely um, well-known brand and audience were they going to start monetizing. So as a business strategy in the podcasting world, um, they looked to spend two years building a brand and following with no monetization points so that they could be solely focused. So when you think about it, I mean, it's not the worst idea I've ever heard is to just focus on growing the audience. Like I can understand the rationale, don't agree with it, but I can understand it. And what happened is they went about building this uh, massive podcast and about a year in, they ran out of money and were forced to take jobs to the side and do other things and it just failed. The project failed because of their inability to make cash and because they hadn't been able to make that a part of the business model earlier, when they started to get desperate, silly moves were made, stress levels went up, emotion went through the roof, business gone. Yep. So it's like I can see, it's very rare to see someone purely long-term focused in business. I think short-term focus is actually the more common one where it's like, how do I make the next sale? 
what's the next hire? But it does come up from time to time of like that long term one. Well, so, so, so totally the long term the long term one you know is typified by by businesses that need to consistently seek funding, right? So and that that's that's the you know like. I, I often talk about Uber because Uber is, an, is like one of the few negatively geared businesses that's going g- growing, right? And and the thing is, it doesn't make any cash <laughs> deliberately. They don't want to make cash. They want to make a loss, but they fund it by continuously increasing their valuation and, and, and having more share options and getting more investors and raising more capital. Now, that is very long-term because imagine if, if for some reason – if the investors didn't want to, nobody wanted to invest anymore, then the whole business would collapse, right? It's that simple. Now, that's that's an example of those kind of long-term strategies. You see that a lot with like, you know, Silicon Valley startups and all of this kind of thing where you know, VC fundraising and all that kind of stuff. Now, that's typically when we're talking about those kind of tech companies. For the average, you know, SME, it's probably going to be, the problem is actually probably going to be more short-term thinking, only short-term thinking, you know? And and when we get out of balance with this, as you pointed out with within real estate, you might, you know, buy buying buying a house in bondi might be awesome right over the next 10 years but if you don't have a short term strategy or a short sword in order to be able to cater to the needs of that longer strategy you're going to you're going to end up probably losing that losing the house and this is what this is why i like to think about real estate from from a very interesting perspective that i that i tend to find a lot of other people don't i always like to think that if i got hit by a truck if I walked out and right now I got hit by a truck, would I wake up wealthier? In a, in a, and I was in a coma for a year. Would I wake up wealthier than when I started? Now, if I have a portfolio of negatively geared properties, the answer is probably no. If I in twelve months' time, I the banks probably I wouldn't have been able to pay the mortgage, and the banks would have foreclosed on them, and they would have been sold. Right? No properties, no income. You know, but if I can invest in assets which can cover all of their own costs and expenses and all of that kind of stuff. And they're still going to grow and do all that kind of stuff. I can actually wake up and be in a better position than when I first started, you know. And the thing is, if you can start to think in that vector, that is going to be in very instructive into how you think about not only real estate but also business. You know, you've got to think about that, and that's when you can actually start to think about real profits and is it actually sustainable? Because if you need to constantly feed the beast, you, you've you've put yourself into a negative position. Position, I think. It's. Something I wish I understood earlier, I'll put it that way. I think it's a very, very interesting perspective uh, in general and interesting thinking that uh, even the idea of considering how much time we spend ourselves thinking short-term and long-term in business Mm. or in real estate and how much time we're making room for either of these is really interesting to me. I want to throw a a curveball at you though because um, I look at this and I think it's one thing to sit here and say that, you know, I'm going to, all right, I'm going to listen to this podcast. I'm now going to go to Brighton and become a cyclist because cycling is awesome and then I'm going to listen to- Cyclists are like vegans, right? Did you you know that I'm a cyclist? By uh, by the way, (laughs) by by the way, just guys, I just wanted to know I'm a cyclist. I, I am enjoying how often I am able to bring it into conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like to think that, you know, people are very inspired by this show and cycling is now the new thing they're going to take up. I don't want to hijack what you're saying because <laughs> I'm interested in your point. But I actually, you know what's funny, Charlie? I actually woke up this morning and I thought, you know what? I think I should start cycling. And I was thinking about you talking about cycling all the time. I was like, you know what? I've got a bike at home. I need to I need to get on the bike and start cycling more. So I think you are you're becoming a cycling and wealth influencer. So you know, I'm just going to say there's a correlation between how much I ride and how good my life is. It, it's <laughs> like doing a lot of K's. Business runs well. Not things tend to not be. Nice. Fascinating correlation. But anyway, to the point here, if someone was to all of a sudden go, okay, well, I'm going to listen to these uh, couple of books that inspire me or make me think bigger, yep. I'm going to do short and long game, I'm going to go away, what role do you think other people have in this? So, for example, one of the things I find very, very interesting in my own path is when I've joined mastermind groups or got into other groups of people and been around different thinking and different people doing different things, that's had a huge impact on directions and ideas for me. So in the context of our own game here, how important or how influential are the people you hang around in this type of approach and this type of thinking? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting one because um, without without any, you know, with, let me phrase that, with absolute certainty, 
the fuel of the information that you consume dictates the way that you think and believe and perceive the world. You know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we are nothing but a bunch of uh, frequency and energy uh, vibrating atoms and stuff like that. And so the, the, the other, um, the other frequencies that you put out, i.e. information is going to dictate the perception of your own reality. Now that can be really good and it can also be really bad. And sometimes the things that people think people think are good can also be bad. Now it is very, it is a very good idea to surround yourself with people who think bigger than you, because that's going to help to expand your potential. So masterminds are really good. Um, being part of social groups is very good and all of that kind of stuff. You don't always need to seek out people that are more successful than you are in a financial perspective or anything like that. Seeking out people with different perspectives can be enough. So for example, you can also get a really good balanced perspective by you know, hanging out with someone who's 80 years old and has no idea about business, but they may give you an insight, which is going to change the way you think about something because they have a different perspective. But here's the thing. It can also be very damaging. And sometimes these masterminds and all of this kind of stuff can actually overstimulate. So l- let me give that some context. So I, I am an idea factory. Like I just, I just, I just, I'm, my brain is constantly whirring with ideas and all of that kind of stuff. It's actually, I've discovered quite damaging for me to continuously see. I, and I really, I get off on learning and growing, you know, so I'll listen to podcasts and read books and I'll be part of masterminds and all this kind of stuff. And I've actually had to start switching everything off. Because what actually starts to happen is you get all these different ideas getting thrown at you and they're all getting stuck in there. And you're going, all right, I go, all right, hang on a second. I need to go and do a, I need to go and do a renovate for profit. And I need to go and do a strategic business partnership. And I need to go and uh, read this other thing. And, and what it does, it creates a lot of internal conflict. And I think that the real interesting uh, insights happen when you actually turn everything off and you're allowed to sit with your own thoughts. You know, like I've, I've, the only thing I've been listening to this past week is Deepak Chopra, one book that's like an hour long. And I've only, and I'm not listening to it constantly either. I'm actually just taking the time to be with my own thoughts because that's what's actually giving the space to think strategically. Because otherwise, all you're doing is, all you're doing is, is digesting and regurgitating other people's uh, ideas. This this whole concept of making space for thinking seems to be the theme with it, within this, yeah. And how to think and bring uh, cause to thinking, which I think is is really fascinating within this. I, I tend to um, share some of that view, especially in business. I haven't experienced it as much in real estate. I haven't been as exposed uh, to information as you have in that regards. Yeah. But in business, I, I certainly can relay the same thing: is uh, to go to an event and there's 10 people, different people doing 10 different things, all being successful, and then somehow I come home with the genius idea to do them all. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're only doing one of them each, but me to do all 10 makes perfect sense. But it's really stressful, isn't it? Because I do the same thing and it'd be like, oh, my God, I just listened to this great marketing podcast and they're talking about this tactic. Oh, Gabby, we should go and do this thing. Oh, it sounds awesome. And all of a sudden you end up stressing yourself out because you're right, you're not focusing on the one thing. Mm, so filtering the noise, such an important ideation here, a way of, of kind of bringing this in. I, I will bring this up on the influence of other people though. One one big benefit I have seen and has become really important to me is that whenever I've been able to be around people that have done the thing I'm attempting to do, mm. so we'll make it real estate in this example. All right, if I've been around someone who's had five houses or owns 10 properties yeah. and I look at their life and I'm like, it didn't turn to shit, they're okay. Yep. Suddenly that, um, not that it gives me permission but it gives me more belief in the idea doesn't have unseen consequences that I might not be around or aware of. It was hugely impactful when I uh, started my agency. I was like, no way, no one's going to ever pay me to run Facebook ads for them. Like who would, no, people, businesses don't buy that. And then to be in a group where everyone was doing it, I was like, oh, like it it can shift you just by who you spend your time with in in such a unique way, which I think is incredibly powerful. Totally. You you need to be very careful to choose your profits, right? P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. Choose your profits wisely because you may find someone who has got, I don't know, 100 properties and you might go, hey, well, they've got 100 properties. I'm going to, they're going to become my profit. However, you might not want the life they have. And if you knew what it took for them to get to where they are, 
would you really want to do that? That's a big question to ask. And so what you can tend to find is you might find people who you want to model, but you only want to model a component of their of their their story, their human being, their, their self, their ideas. And I think that this is a really interesting thing that people need to play into because it's, for example, let's use Grant Cardone because he's quite quite a populist. You know, a lot of people know who Grant Cardone is. Hustle, yeah, whoa. And he's like got a billion dollars of real estate under management. Rah, fantastic. And he's got a jet and all of that kind of stuff. And a lot of people aspire to that because like, I want a billion dollars of real estate under management. I want a jet. It's like, yeah, but do you want the life that Grant Cardone has? Would you be comfortable with that risk? Would you be comfortable? Would you like, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so thinking about the second and third order consequences of that, you may actually find that, you know, trying to build a 30 property portfolio may not be the thing that serves you. Maybe what you actually need to do is build a six property portfolio, but have them that are they're all very high cash flow assets and you don't need to work anymore after four years. Boom, done. Job, jobs are good and you can move to Yamba. It's really nice here. Or, you know, or vice versa, you know, in a business, a lot of people talk about, I want to grow a $10 million a year company. It's like, yeah, okay, sure. But like, really, why? I, I was talking to a business owner about this exact thing the other day. They're going, well, make it profit. Life's good. Uh, but they said that they were feeling a little stuck. And I was like, stuck? Why? They're like, oh, we're just like, we're just struggling to grow. I was like, why are you trying to grow? Oh, because we, we want to hit this target. You know, this, this, you know, it was a, you know, a couple of million bucks or whatever. I was like, why? Like, why do you want to hit that target? And they're like, I don't know. I just kind of decided that that was the goal. And I was like, well, what, what fundamentally, like what, how would that improve your life? They're like, well, I'm, I'm like, well, you'd have to hire more team. You'd need to do all this kind of stuff. How much would your profits go up? Is that actually worth? Is it actually worth it? Maybe you should think about what you have right now and decide: is that satisfying you? And if not, what part about your current existence is not satisfying? Is it financial? Do you need to make more revenue? Do you need more time? You know, what is the what is the actual characteristic of the thing that you lack? And I think it's really interesting because you can find people who are really great at health. You know, they may be the, I, I aspire to be as fit and strong as this person here, but they've, they've got no financial management skills. And so you don't want to model them completely. You just want to model the fitness side of their 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 world. Does that kind of make sense? Went on a ramble. Hugely so. I was nearly going to put in a cycling example, but I'll leave it <laughs> out being that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love this saying is like everybody wants to be a beast until it's time to do what the beast does. Yeah, totally. Totally. Well, well we've covered the uh, points I wanted to make sure we hit on today, Goose. Is there anything else you wanted to bring up or bring into this discussion? No, I think we've, I think I think this is good. I, I, I like this episode because it's um, – our last episode we were quite tactical talking about the budget and all of that kind of stuff. I think this one we've gone very much to a thinking paradigm level, which is really – the 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 plane at which I, I I love to operate at you know like how can we actually think about our lives differently how can we think about business differently how can we think about real estate differently how can we think about fulfillment different differently because really that's the goal right fulfillment you know and fulfillment I think doesn't isn't attached to a specific monetary outcome I you know I little side note I actually wrote down you know when I was uh, you know, after I was when I was sitting in the woods last week, and I, <laughs> after I've been listening to some Deepak Chopra or something like that, actually maybe I was re- listening to the book about archangels. I'm not sure, but I, I had a bit of thinking time to myself, and I I was just sitting in silence, giving myself space to thought, and I wrote down a single question, and that question was, "What do I want?" Simple. What do I want? And I sat there thinking about it for a long time. And the, the answer that I came up with, which was the most uh, comprehensively succinct yet um, poignantly true, was I want to be intellectually stimulated and financially rewarded. You know, I want to feel like my brain operates in a way that is fluid and is stimulated and is challenged and I'm excited intellectually and I want to be financially rewarded for that. Not what do I want, a million dollars in a helicopter. It's like, no, all I want is to be intellectually stimulated and financially rewarded and that's as, that's as clear cut as it gets. And then when you start to actually change the way that you decide what is going to give you the fulfillment you need, then you can actually start to reframe what assets, what resources, uh, what strategies, what you know, what operating procedures you need to apply in order to achieve that outcome. Because you may find that it is tremendously different from your current worldview. You may find that the thing that you have right now is absolutely the antithesis of the thing that you ultimately desire. And it is in that confrontation of reality that I think you'll find true peace. 
Do you know what? I think you've picked the perfect career path for that goal or for that desire or want. It's like the industry is set for that. Yeah, I I, I agree. I, I think it's... I think it's fascinating. I think the whole I think the whole real estate world is is oh, just tremendously interesting. And I and I and I, and you know the the position that I am lucky enough to be in is is I get to think strategically for other people, not just myself. It's not just myself. I get to the oh, okay, hmm, what situation are you in? And all that kind of, and the intellectual stimulation is absolutely there. And you know, ultimately it the all the strategies are designed around wealth creation and stuff. So I think it's I think it's truly fascinating and a good way to exist so i think this episode has been really beneficial what do you think i've enjoyed it it's been a lot of fun great awesome sweet well let's wrap it up let's get stuck let's get prepped for the next one awesome can i say one thing yeah it lights me up when someone contacts me and tells me what they think about the business and property series for those of you that have done it a big thank you i've enjoyed the conversations if you've been thinking about it contact me or goose we'd love to hear your feedback it's so good it's so good we we both get a big kick out of it we we chat on slack and we're like oh my god oh yeah just just heard from this person so yeah i I echo that charlie if you if you are enjoying this then please let us know give us feedback also feel free to give us suggestions on things you want us to cover because um in case you can't tell we love a chat so we're happy to cover things that you want to hear as well so till then see you in the next episode